on News Hour tonight. Customs officer dies during appearance before House of Representatives panel. Federal government steps down minimum wage memo for consultations. Northwest Peace and Security Summit ends with renewed hope for regional collaboration. And on the foreign scene, at least 24 killed by flooding landslides after heavy rains in Ivory Coast. Hello and welcome to the News Hour on Trust Television. I am Aisha Salihu. And now the news in detail. The Nigeria Customs Service has announced the passing of Itop Andrew Essien, who served as the Deputy Controller in charge of revenue in the account unit of the service. DC Essien, who was in charge of the reconciliation of revenue for the service, passed away this Tuesday while making presentation before the House of Representatives Committee on Public Accounts. A statement by the National Public Relations Officer of the Service, Abdullahi Mewada, said three minutes into the presentation, Essien requested water and showed signs of discomfort, adding that despite immediate efforts to assist him, he unfortunately passed away. Mewada noted that the late DC Essien was known for his diligence and exceptional service in the accounts unit. He added Essien's role as a DC revenue was pivotal in ensuring the accurate reconciliation of revenue, which he performed with utmost precision and dedication. Meanwhile, the Comptroller General of Customs, Bashir Adeni, and House of Representatives have both commiserated with the family, friends, and colleagues of the deceased over his untimely passing. The same thing applies for 2017. And 2017 can be seen in the next page. That's 20. Okay, 2016. If you look at 2016, it encompasses other levies. I will still, the first one I picked was for only one levy. If you check uh, 2016, you will see other levies. That is, um, you see the 30% levy on sanitary waste. You can see the, that's page six. You can see the levy there. And then you also see a textile levy, cement levy, and others. So I may need to take water. You need to take water, sir? Yes, sir. Yes, go ahead. Or if you need tea, do you need tea? I may need to take water. Still on the Green Chambers of the National Assembly, stakeholders and members of the House of Representatives Committee on Corporate Social Responsibility have deferred on a bill for an act to regulate corporate social responsibility in Nigeria and other related matters. These divergent views came up during a public hearing on the bill on Tuesday in Abuja. Chairman of the committee, Lilian Orogbu, expressed displeasure over the absence of telecom giants like MTN Airtel, which she said amounted to treating the invitation of the parliament with levity, despite the enabling environment given them by government to operate. Please provide a common understanding of what constitutes Responsible business conduct in the Nigerian context, applying mandatory and voluntary CSR practices. This will ensure a baseline for social responsibility while allowing companies to labor their efforts to their specific circumstances. Stakeholders like the Central Bank of Nigeria and the Nigerian Communication Commission say it is a welcome development even as they made contributions to the proposed amendment that would ensure all parties are protected. It is uh, misplaced for non-compliance with CSR to be punishable by imprisonment. We believe this penalty is too stringent. More so, this raises concerns regarding its compatibility with constitutional rights and freedoms, particularly those safeguarding property and economic liberties of citizens. 
but it will make the Nigerian market less competitive, unlike what is obtainable in countries like South Africa and Egypt. CSR is about the integration of social environmental concerns by businesses into the operations and should enhance socially responsible and sustainable business practices. The BA may not encourage any sustainable social programs by the corporations. Earlier, the Speaker of the House of Representatives, who was represented by the House Majority Leader Julius Yvonne Bere, spelled out the essence of the proposed amendment to the bill and called on all stakeholders to make useful contributions to it. The success of this legislative process is dependent on your response and contribution to this public hearing. Public hearing is part of our legislative process to engage the citizens in lawmaking, especially because the proposed law has impacts to make on the people. Your robust ideas and expected contributions to the discourse will no doubt shape the outcome of this public hearing today. The bill, when passed, will ensure that corporate bodies provide social amenities for communities where they operate. The National Minimum Wage Tripartite Committee has submitted its report to President Bola Tinubu. Minister of Information revealed this to newsmen at State House Abuja on Tuesday after a meeting of the Federal Executive Council. Discussions on the new minimum wage were, however, stepped down, which, according to the minister, would enable the president to consult widely before taking a final decision that would be forwarded to the National Assembly. The debate on a new minimum wage is yet to reach a conclusion, and just when it seemed the conclusion would be reached, another set of consultations are set to begin. This time around, the president will be directly involved in the consultations. On the new national minimum wage, Mr. President is going to consult further so that he can have an informed uh, position because the new national minimum wage, like I said, is not just an issue of the federal government. It affects the state governments, it affects the local governments, it also affects the organized private sector. And that is why it is called national minimum wage. It's not just an affair of the federal government. But all that is being done is to ensure the process is all encompassing. Or is this not a contradiction seeing that the old minimum wage expired on the 31st of March? The minister thinks not as he explains that the federal government will continue to pay wage awards until the new minimum wage is agreed upon and passed. Organized private sector and the government representatives uh, reached an agreement which they afforded to Mr. President. Of course, you know that uh, the organized labor uh, had an objection to that, but consistent with the way it should be done, the Tripartite Committee has submitted its report first to Mr. President, and then there was a memo to discuss that at the Federal Executive Council meeting. I Developments on the new minimum wage were announced on the day Minister of Finance announced that the federal government was considering the issuance of a dollar-denominated bond in the second quarter of 2024 to attract foreign exchange liquidity and stabilize the Naira. The International Monetary Fund has raised concerns that the domestic dollar bond issuance could exacerbate pressures on the Naira and increase the costs of associated with Naira securities. But the finance minister explains that there is already competition from several Nigerians within and outside the country willing to invest for better interest yielding. The, the, the path to growth of the economy based on stabilizing inflation is projected to come down and we can expect it to come down. Uh, the, 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 a good harvest will help with that. Growth will help with that. The exchange rate is stabilizing, and with more reserves coming in, it will uh, can be expected to uh, appreciate. That will bring down interest rates or give a chance for interest rates to now come down, for the monetary authorities to ease off, tightening as a way of uh, squeezing out inflation. And that's the path to growth. And the Honorable Minister of Works, I'm sure, he will take you through some of the core... 
The Debt Management Office is presently working on appointing advisors and determining the offer, size, tenure and pricing modality for the bond's issuance, with the target investors being local residents and the Nigerian diaspora. From State House Abuja, Kende Amudu, Trust TV News. Developing agriculture and improving security have been identified as the gateway to economic prosperity for northwest Nigeria as the region continues to grapple with rising instability. Stakeholders who took part in the inaugural Peace and Security Summit of the Northwest say the time for action has come if the most populous region in the country is to live up to its full potential. Abdullah Yamadi has more in this report. Participants at this event agreed that Northwest Nigeria has become a victim of its own neglect, particularly in key sectors such as education, human capital development and agriculture. These areas could have significantly boosted the region's economy and well-being. On the final day of the two-day summit, discussions focused on both the challenges and potential solutions. Panelists identified the gaps that have plagued the region, leading to its rapid decline and instability over the years. Now, the regulatory section, we are able to trace out the root cause of these problems and we are able to propose a solution to this. And uh, there now, in order, why it is different from other conferences that are there. And that same closing session, we are able to establish a standing committee between us, the development partners, and other stakeholders. Now, that standing committee will continue, we'll give them three weeks to come out with a roadmap on how we are going to implement all the recommendations of this project. For you to address the insecurity, you have to look at the root cause. You have to address the root cause. You have to look at the economic perspective of it. Solving the problem in a kinetic way is another way. But essentially, the most important and durable solution, a sustainable solution, is looking at the root cause and looking at the economic aspect of the whole 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 issue. Because when you look at the criminality that is happening in the Northwest, it's not ideological, it's purely economic. Other stakeholders examined the historical evolution of the crisis and suggested that a holistic approach is needed to end insecurity in the Northwest region. They emphasized the importance of regional cooperation as a secondary measure while stressing the need to identify and expose those within the region who are contributing to the problem. The Northwest is battling too many issues. The major one, which is security. Yes. Without which we cannot make any meaningful progress. And therefore it came timely because we are concerned about people. As leaders, we can't just sit down and see people being killed left, right, and center without addressing these challenges. And that is the whole essence of this summit. Former Governor of Katsina State Ibrahim Shema advocated for a results oriented approach to ending insecurity, emphasizing that there is no time to waste, noting that a significant portion of the population in the Northwest region is plagued by insecurity, leaving many without any means of livelihood. So when you are talking about commercial development, you can't run away from the issue of livestock development as well. This you have to find a way to support the, the cattle riara, the full animal. Because the full animal somehow is neglected. That is the reason why they, they move oftentimes from the northern part of Nigeria to the southern part of Nigeria in such a question. Okay? Public commentators and security experts hope to see a paradigm shift from past conversations following the recently concluded Northwest Regional Summit on security. They aim to provide residents with some respite and an opportunity to pursue their legitimate means of livelihood. Abdullahi Ismayamadi, Trust Television News, Katsina. Still in the northwest region of the country, armed bandits in the early hours of Tuesday attacked a mosque in Tazame community in the Bungudu local government area of Zamfara State. A resident of the said 
community said bandits stormed the community when they were preparing for the early morning prayers. He added the bandits also shot the imam who sustained an injury in his leg and abducted about 10 persons. The spokesperson for the Zamfara State Police Command, ASP Yazid Abubakar, said two persons were killed while some persons were also kidnapped. He said the command has deployed more officers to the area to restore normalcy and ensure the rescue of the kidnapped victims. A Barano State High Court judge, Justice Haruna Mshelia, has been abducted along with his wife and orderly. They were traveling from Biu in southern Barnu to Meduguri. The Barnu State Police Command's public relations officer, Kenneth Daso, who confirmed the incident, said the judge was abducted at Kupja Town, a border local government between Yobe and Barnu State around 9 a.m. According to the police spokesman, the judge's relative reported that occupants of two other commercial vehicles were also abducted alongside the judge. He said the abductors are yet to make contact with the family of the judge. And now to the North Central. The Benway State Police Command has rescued nine persons who were abducted from a vehicle traveling along the Ojano Ogleu Road near Otopo local government area of the state. The incident occurred on June 13, 2024, when gunmen ambushed a Benue Lynx vehicle carrying passengers from Onisha to Makodi. According to a statement by the Police Public Relations Officer for the Benue State Command, SP Catherine Anene, the assailants emerged from a nearby forest, shooting sporadically at the vehicle and forcing it to stop. The driver was killed in the process after sustaining fatal gunshot injuries while the passengers were taken hostage. Anene confirmed that the police responded promptly to the incident, rescuing nine kidnapped victims and apprehending some of the kidnappers. And now to the Federal Capital Territory, the FCT Emergency Management Agency has appealed to residents of Trademore Estate located at the Lube area in the country's capital to vacate the estate as part of measures to prevent likely loss of lives and properties in the event of a recurrence of floods that have wreaked havoc in the area in the past. The agency made the call through its acting director, Florence Dawon, during an exclusive interview with Trust TV after the Monday morning rain that flooded parts of the estate. Trust TV's Noel Sampson has more. At the drop of the first heavy rains in the FCT, the Trademore estate along the airport road suffered flood in the early hours of Monday, leaving many wondering if this is a sign of what will play out throughout the rainy season. Flooding in the estate has been a perennial occurrence every rainy season, prompting the FCDA to announce last year that it would demolish structures on waterways in the estate and other estates across the FCT. Residents of the affected areas, however, opposed these remedial measures with no remedial efforts carried out after last year's floods, many have been asking what will likely be the solution to the reoccurring problem. The lasting solution, like you have rightly said, is that the houses, structures that are sitting on the waterways are supposed to be removed because they are, they are obstructing the free flow of water. If an opportunity is given to FCT administration and we are able to remove these obstructions, then we'll be able to walk on the waterways there, put, give them good infrastructure that will stop the estate from being flooded. She appealed to the judiciary, the National Assembly, as well as developers of the Trademore Estate to look into the matter critically with a view of finding lasting solutions. FCT administration, we are only struggling. We are not going to collect the land from, from them. After demolishing the houses, nobody is going to take your house from you. Nobody is going to, to confiscate that plot of land. It's just to make sure we put in good infrastructures in place, mitigative measures in place to, to stop uh, from for, further occurrence of flooding at that location. The owner of Trademore, the private developer himself, we are pleading with him, we are calling on him to come to their aid. When things like this happen, it's the fear of unknown. 
a lot of people, may, maybe some of them are retirees. They have put in the, the, their life savings there. A visit to the estate shows how hostile these residents are as they refuse to speak to us. However, we are able to speak to a resident who craved anonymity. He believes the demolition of the buildings in the estate is not the solution to the problem. The, the solution, my brother. They took, they took. Can I speak? Okay, sir. The solution, my brother, is not demolition. I'm being very, I don't have any house here. I'm being very clear about it. The solution to this problem is not demolition at all. Not even a single house. The problem for this, to this, in this place is for FCDA. Wiki, as he is now, Wiki is a very strong man. He's a very active, strong, he's too intelligent. It's only Wiki that can solve the problem of this place, though. No human being on earth. Because it will require Jesus Bejas to come here, all, 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 all the good construction company to come here. Nigerians in and around the estate are hopeful that a lasting solution to the flooding incidents in these estates will be provided soonest. No. Samson, Trust TV News, Abuja. And now to the southwest region of the country. The Lagos State Commissioner for Health, Professor Akin Abayomi, has called on all Lagos residents to support the government's efforts by adhering to hygiene practices. Professor Abayomi made this appeal at a press briefing on cholera outbreak in the state. Cholera is a waterborne disease caused by bacteria that can be easily spread through contaminated hands or contact with someone who has been in contact with contaminated water or sweat containing pathogens. The Lagos State Commissioner for Health, Professor Aki Abayomi, has confirmed that the total number of suspected cases in the state is 579 with 29 deaths. Most of the cases involved patients who were brought into the health facility late. Professor Abayomi stated that a cholera strain affecting residents in the state is subtype O1, which is highly contagious and causes significant illness. He further reported that there are 209 cases in the general hospitals, 193 in primary health facilities, 152 in private hospitals, and 14 in the military, police, and other security agencies in the states. We have some very severe cases that we were able to rescue. Very severe dehydration at the um, uh, infectious disease hospital because their kidneys had shut down from the severe dehydration. And at that facility, we have access to renal dialysis. So we're able to wake the kidneys back up with renal dialysis and rehydrate them. And those are the kinds of cases that we still have on admission because they were very, very severe and were able to rescue them from dying. As I said, most of the patients that did die were either brought in dead or by the time they came in, they were so severely dehydrated, we could not rescue them, which is why we reiterate that once you develop symptoms, please do not stay at home. While you're at home, use oral rehydration therapy and present yourself to the nearest facility, ideally a public health facility because your treatment there will be free. But if you go to a private facility, they will first of all give you first aid treatment and then you can request to be referred to a public health facility where your treatment will be free. Officials of Lagos State Government also aired their views on how they're helping to curb the spread of this disease. All the cameramen, all the people that work for you, just continue to tell them, have you washed your hand? Have you washed your hand? All those food sellers on the side. What, which water, where do they get their water from? Don't just drink water anyhow. Yes, it's hot and you're thirsty. Watch what you in, ingest. Food, water, beverage, it really doesn't matter. Once it's contaminated and it gets into your mouth, you may get, and I said may, may get cholera. So thank you very much. We also have um, a team that check regularly our toilet facilities and we have also trained and um, enlightened our teachers on the necessary step to take if there is a, uh, a, a need for for a student being sick or whatever based on uh, cholera. You absolutely should raise an alarm, discuss with people around you. When you see them doing those things, report to us, report to the Ministry of Environment, all are separate, we're going to take it up. But I think that it is everyone's responsibility. It is a community-led sensitization program. You are going to take ownership of your own space, your own streets, your own environment. 
and raise alarm whenever you find something that is not properly done. They called on the general public to engage in frequent hand washing and proper sanitation of our environments. This is the news hour coming to you live from Trust Television Studios in the nation's capital, still ahead. Mixed reactions trail free for all harvest of dead will as government collects samples for testing. More news on return this day. Attention loyal readers, exciting news coming your way. That's right. Starting from the first weekend in July 2024, we're bringing you something special. We're saying goodbye to Daily Trust on Sunday and hello to the all-new Weekend Trust. Every Saturday, beginning July 6, 2024, get ready for a richer, redesigned weekend reading experience. Weekend Trust will be your perfect weekend companion, packed with all the news, views and analysis you love. Missing the Sunday edition? No worries. Weekend Trust will fill the gap and more. And don't forget, you can stay up to date with breaking news on our website at www.dailytrust.com. Mark your calendars for Saturday, July 6, 2024. Weekend Trust is coming out soon and you won't want to miss out. Welcome back and thanks for staying. Let's have another look at some of our top stories. Customs officer dies during appearance before House of Representatives panel. Federal government steps down minimum wage memo for consultations. Moving on to more stories, the Federal High Court sitting in Lagos has ordered the final for feature to the federal government of the sum of $1.4 million linked to a former Central Bank of Nigeria, Governor Godwin Emefele. Justice Ayakunle Faji gave the order after hearing an application filed and argued by the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission. The order is coming a few days after another judge of the same court, Justice Chuku Cheku Aneke, ordered the final for feature of over 12.18 billion naira in money and properties linked to the MFLA. At Tuesday's proceedings, counsel to the EFCC, Bilkisu Buhari Bala, urged Justice Faji to grant the final for feature order of the money domiciled in an account, in an account number in Titan Trust Limited to the Nigeria government. The EFCC counsel told the court that the application is pursuant to Section 17 of the Advance Fee Fraud and Other Fraud Related Offences Act No. 14, 2006, and Section 44, Subsection 2B of the 1999 Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. The Gombe State Police Command has arrested four people for alleged criminal conspiracy and theft of transformers. The suspect, which includes the village head and serving councillor, was arrested while transporting a transformer stolen from Garin Majidadi of the Akko local government area of the state. Hassan Koli has more. These are the four people suspected to have stolen a transformer in Majidadi village in Akko local government area of Gwambe state. Parading the suspect at the command headquarters in Gwambe on Monday, Police Public Relations Officer Buhari Abdullahi said the suspect included the serving councillor representing Kumo East, the village head of Garim Majidadi, and two others. We have Muhammad Majidadi, 40 years of age, a village head of Garim Majidadi village, Kumo, our local government. Number two, we have Honorable Abdullahi M. Fanda, 43 years of age, a councillor representing Kumo East. Number three, we have Mohammed Sani, male of 43 years of age, Sarkinya Ikotas Kumo, our local government. Wild receiver is Bello R. Okumo, 59 years of age, of Jaura Musa Quarters Kumo, our local government area. That on the 21st of June 2024, at about 17.5 hours, while acting on a credible intelligence information, police detectives from Akko Division intercepted the above mentioned suspect who stolen electrical transformer, which was stolen from Garimajid Adi village. The said transformer has since been recovered, as you can see. 
The counselor, however, distanced himself from stealing the said transformer, saying they were acting on the community's request. I am here for the case of transformer theft. However, it is not a theft. The transformer was donated to the community by a politician, and the community is the one who decided to sell it. We sat down together with the bloodshed of Garim Majidadi and all stakeholders before making the decision to sell the transformer. I even asked them to try it officially before we proceed. The issue is that it was sold before getting approval from appropriate authorities, but it is not a theft. The police confirmed that the transformer was sold at the price of 1,500,000 naira to one Bello Ardo Kumo who is under police custody and will be charged to court upon the conclusion of the investigation. Hassan Kohli, Trust TV News, Gwambi. Still on security matters, students of the Federal Polytechnic Bauchi residing in Gwalameji, an off-campus community near the school, on Tuesday took to the streets to protest the alarming surge of armed robberies and rape cases in the area. The students during the protest blocked the federal highway along Bauchi Das Road. According to a press release by the Bauchi State Police Command, the protest was sparked by an incident where a group of hoodlums made their way into students' housing and robbed one Kletus Chomo, a 50-year-old resident of Saronia Lodge. The statement noted that Chomo was reportedly injured during the incident. In response, a team of police officers from the E Division and tactical units were quickly deployed to the area and managed to bring the situation under control. The protest by the Gwalameji students highlights the growing concerns over the rise in criminal activities in the area, which have left many residents, particularly the students' population, feeling increasingly vulnerable. And on to the south-south region of the country, the Ipoh community women have blocked the entrance to the Port Hackett Airport in River State. As early as 7.30 a.m. on Tuesday morning, the women from Ipoh, which is one of the host communities of the airport, blocked the gate at the airport roundabout, waving placards, singing, wailing, and even cooking at the gate. They carried banners with inscriptions like, We demand our citizens' rights, Ipoh women peaceful protest, among others. Their actions had caused a build-up of traffic as passengers could not access the airport. This would be the second time in six months the women are protesting. In the meantime, Governor Simina Lai Fubara have reacted to the recent protests by women from Ipo. Fubara expressed optimism about resolving the issues between the community and the airport management. The governor noted that the community apart from demanding the implementation of corporate social responsibility, became angry when none of their indigents was included in the recent recruitment of about 50 airport staff by the airport authority. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, Finima Youth in the Boni local government area of River State on Tuesday shut down two major oil service companies, Saipem Construction Nigeria Limited and Daewoo Engineering and Construction Limited, over alleged neglect and marginalization. The companies are key contractors in the ongoing Train 7 project of the Nigeria Liquefied Natural Gas Limited. Braving the heavy rain, the youth barricaded the gates halting the entry and exit of staff. The protesters demanded the enforcement of the Local Content Development Act of 2017, which mandates the inclusion of host communities in significant projects. 
but claim their community has been sidelined in the Train 7 project, a major venture aimed at boosting the nation's gas production and economic growth. Reacting to the accusations, the Nigeria LNG Limited Acting General Manager, External Relations and Sustainable Development, Charles Ekbele, said the matter is between the workers and the contractors and not directly with the firm. Epele, who disclosed that engagements to resolve the issue amicably are underway, added that NLNG prioritizes inclusiveness and calls for a peaceful resolution to express grievances. <laughs> The Nigerian Midstream and Downstream Petroleum Regulatory Authority says it takes seriously its responsibility to monitor and regulate the mid and downstream sectors of the petroleum industry in the country. NMDPRA's Executive Director, Distribution Systems, Storage and Retailing Infrastructure, Ogbogbo Ukoha, made this known in a statement on Tuesday. Ukoha was responding to allegations by the Dangote Refinery that some major oil marketers are importing dirty fuel into the country. He said the sulfur content of products being imported into the country is well below the 50 parts per million regulatory allowance. He said the authority strictly monitors compliance with the PPM by all importers and refiners. He called on Nigerians not to panic as the production in the market are safe for consumption. Okoha also revealed that the authority met on Tuesday with marketers and refiners to ensure a level playing field between independent marketers who import and local refiners to ensure supply stability within a stable price regime. Still in the South South, residents of Yenagoa, the Bayelsa state capital, have been reacting to the slaughtering of a giant whale in brass local government area. The whale, seen as manna from heaven by residents in Okboma, was found dead at the bank of the Atlantic in Brass Island. Trustivers Friday Bimobawe Peter completes the report. Some residents of Okboma in Brass who took part in the slaughtering of the giant whale said the economic hardship in the country left them and by the implication others with no choice than to took part in the feast. It is like, it's, it's a tobacco shape of animal. But when you cut it, some part is red, some part is greenish, some part is uh, bluish, and some part looks like stick. I saw it myself, my wife caught it, and we have to spend time to wash it because we don't know what killed it. We parboil it, wash it again, then use spices before we dry it. And what we have can, can serve us about six months. So you could see that we've got all the segments of grain. And because of the hardship, and so before you know, we, we swam on it and cut it into pieces. We could see only one, like just like a downfall, just like a small car. Sometimes we are aware that sheep owners, uh, vessel owners, sometimes because of the uh, problematic nature of whales, sometimes they throw uh, substance into drum or drum-like things and the, the whales sometimes swallow these things. So it used to kill whales uh, because the whales are very dangerous in terms of uh, the sea movement and ocean movement. So sometimes as a result of that, some of them we are murdered. So maybe this one, maybe it's of that form or how. Because sometimes when they open their belly, you can see over five, four drums inside their belly. A renowned environmental activist, Alago Morris, who showed Trust TV crew the bones and teeth of a baby whale, spoke on its economic value. Uh, the bone is very big. That's a big whale. Now I have one here, which is of a, a baby whale. This is a bone, the spinal cord of a baby whale. 
then what we saw as they were butchering, we saw a very big, something like drum, you know, round. So it's actually a mighty uh, whale that uh, was washed ashore. Even government should encourage non-governmental organizations that will come up as a conservationist, you know, to pursue the issue of conservation. And they should also, as government, should also encourage, you know, you know, budgeting towards those type of things. Because these wildlife encourage tourism in other countries and it brings a lot of revenue. People go to Kenya, South Africa, and some other African countries because of, even Tanzania, because of wildlife. So we have our shoreline, beautiful shoreline. I was in Kolama the other day, and uh, somebody was telling me, a chief was saying, the dolphins, there are times when the dolphins will come and play. They will come and play like as if they are doing sports. Come out, jump, they will go like that in group. You know, those type of things are things that tourists would like to see. You just want to know the time that they, they, they have been coming out. And uh, if security is taken care of, we can boost our tourism through protection, conservation of our wildlife. The Director of Public Health in the Bayelsa State Minister of Health, Yeribule Misto, said a medical team from the ministry has been sent to the community for sensitization and collected blood sample of some people who took part in the feast for test. We engaged with stakeholders, we educated them on the issues on ground and hill effect, and then we also ensured that we um, also visited all of the people who were identified to have eaten from the, uh, from the dead way. And um, we medically examined them and uh, we took their details. We are following them well, for the next two weeks. We'll be calling them every day to see what is happening. We also went to the health facility of Oma and ensured that we had also dropped some medications in case any of them come down with any of these diseases, they will quickly be treated. But for Fushaw, this, uh, of course, I heard this is not the first time that has happened. And again, it might also might happen again in Fushaw. They have been lucky so far, but um, for a third time, it might not, it might not be that lucky. According to some residents, the bones of a whale can be used to make cheers. From Yenagua, Friday, Ibimobowe Peter. Trust TV News, Yenagua. In the southwest region of the country, consumption of new yam in ancient Yoruba towns is heralded by traditional rites in line with culture. The new yam rites is a key component of Omodenje festival in Elasha Ijesha town of Obokun local government area of Ocean State. Hamido everybody has more. Elaja is a traditional rite that must be carried out before new yam could be brought to the market or consumed by people in Elashe Ijesha town in Obokun local government area of Oshun State. The traditional ruler of the town, Alashe of Elashe, Obajima Isiaka Adeshina said, Elaja is a key component of the Omadenje annual festival in Elashe Ijesha. The meaning of Elaja is for new yam to enter market. If you have not entered, if we have not doing that Elaja, that means the new yam cannot enter market. And the community cannot even eat, as well as the royal's father, cannot eat the new, the new yam until when the, uh, the Elaja takes place. So after the Elaja takes place, that's only when we can eat the new yam. That's only when new yam can enter our market. In accordance with the tradition, a very senior traditional chief in Elashe Ijesha, the Ordofin must be in seclusion for seven days as part of the activities commemorating the festival. Uh, Ordofin have to be in a seclusion for good seven days. We are, he will be praying for the peace uh, of the town, development of the town and for all people, both home and abroad. The leader of the female traditional chiefs in the town Yerisha of Ilashe Ijesha, Fumilayo Ashaulu Akindele, and the district head of the Aajo Ajarabiolu town, 
ala jo ajarabi olumokaila a DBC cautioned traders against inflating prices of commodities in the market. So I went to Ilase market, shadow market, Ilase Gesa, to go and tell our people there that selling the market there to reduce their price, that they are selling their market. My advice for market women in our market, Oja Itedo Ilase Gesa, to know set the higher price for all our community members. The people of Ilashe Ejesha are resolute in their determination to sustain the culture and tradition of the ancient town. Amid Ojiegbade, Trust TV News, Oshobo. Let's join Yusuf Akogu for the business news. Welcome to Business News. I am Yusuf Akogu. Nigeria's all commodity terms of trade have declined by 0.12 percentage points in the first quarter of 2024, just as the value of import increased by 0.51 percentage points during the period. The National Bureau of Statistics NBS disclosed this on Monday in its all commodity price indices and terms of trade report for Q1 2024. He noted that an increase in the terms of trade within two periods means that the value of export is increasing relative to the value of import and the country can afford more import for the same value of export. The NBS also said that the all group export and all group import indices increased by 0.39%. Terms of trade is the ratio between a country's export and its import prices. The World Bank says that this bought a total of $45.5 million to the National Identity Management Commission under the Digital Identification for Development Project. According to the report published by the bank on its website, the project is aimed at enrolling more Nigerians for the National Identification Number, NIM. According to the Britain Wood Institution, Nigeria was able to secure the funding with the passing into law of the Nigeria Protection Act in June last year. The fund was disbursed in multiple tranches between December 2021 and April 2024, and disbursement is still ongoing. The $45 million so far released represents about 10.5% of the total project cost, which is put at $430 million. Nigeria's equities market opened the week in red due to profit taken by investors. Let's see how it went down today. Leading the losing equities, the CWG Computer Warehouse Group down 9.57% to close at 5 naira and 20 copper per share. Oando PLC ended on the losing side today, 9.39% to close at 12 naira and 55 copper per share. Of course, UPL also there, 9.09% it lost to close at 2 naira and 50 copper per share. Of course, this has dragged down the market down marginally by 0.09%. Volume of trade. 361.572 million shares uh, were traded there, valued at 6.163 billion era, in the days of 8,511 lead exchanges among investors today. Of course, the top trading equities by volume there is Transcorp Nigeria leading that table there for 7.509 uh, million shares traded. Jitco, uh, 37.851 million shares. Of course, Veritas Capital, 34.950 million shares it traded as well. Of course, some equities ended on the gaining side of the market. Leading that table is Okomo Oil up there 10% to close 291 naira and 50 copper per share. John Hot also up there as well. 9.79% uh, it gained to close at 3 naira and 14 copper per, sh per share there. NSL Tech also up there 9.09% to close at 60 copper per share. And that's the highlight of stock trading as it went down this uh, Tuesday on the floor of NGS. Let's see the global stock market and exchange rate data for today. <music>
oil prices rose about 1% on Monday, spurred by the prospect of strong summers driving demand and as tension in the Middle East and drone attacks on Russia refinery led to concerns about supply. At the London market, Brent crude sells for $85 per barrel. For the paper basket, price moves up to $86 per barrel. And that's business. I am Yusuf Akogun. <music>